Hello, everybody. Welcome to the morning show. We're coming to you on WJOP LP New Report at FM 96.3 on Channel 9 and on New Report Community Media's YouTube channel at ncmhub.org. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I am so happy to welcome Cynthia Vinnie, a media psychologist, to the show this morning. I've been looking forward to talking to her since I read a fascinating article she wrote about Stranger Things. So let me tell you a little bit about Cynthia. She has a degree in media psychology from the Feeling Graduate University. She also has a degree in film from Cornell University. She's worked in the film and television industry, researching for film and television projects, reading and analyzing scripts, and preparing and editing memos and letters for production companies. She's conducted many studies on popular media, fictional stories, and fans, and has co-authored two books on these topics, including Finding Truth in Fiction, What Fan Culture Gets Right, and Why It's Good to Get Lost in a Story, which came out from Oxford University Press. One of the shows that she's written about, which she'll talk about with us today, is the hugely popular Netflix series, Stranger Things. Cynthia, welcome to The Morning Show, and thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my pleasure. Well, let's start here, uh, Cynthia. I have to confess to not having been familiar with the niche of media psychologist. So I was hoping that we could start by you describing what it is that media psychologists study and what you do with the research you do. Absolutely. Um, you're not alone. A lot of people are not familiar with media psychology. <laughs> it's a fairly new branch of psychology. And it's not so much that people haven't thought about things that, that psychology and media, that cross section, but it's been more normally part of communications or media studies or film studies, things like that. Um, so media psychology as a discipline in psychology has been fairly new. Um, I think the, the American Psychological Association didn't even recognize it until the mid 80s. Ah. Um, so, so very, very new branch. And the purview of it is very wide. Um, and that's where it, it gets confusing too. Um, so for example, what I study is about fans and fans of popular culture and what are they getting out of media, um, I tend to focus on the positive benefits versus the mm -hmm. negative benefits. Um, but other people study things like how social media is affecting mm. uh, people and things like uh, how we perceive different kinds of media cognitively, what are our brains doing? How do we process the messages? Um, so it's this huge swath of things that sort of fall into this bucket that is media psychology, but fundamentally, it's just about that cross section between how people and media intersect and what do we get out of it, hmm. either positive or negative. Well, thank you for that, because media plays such a prominent role in our lives more and more, and it makes mm -hmm. sense that it would become a, a specialty, but as you explained, a broad-based specialty, because it covers a lot of turf. Yeah. Well, I, I know that one of the things that you're most interested in is how we use stories in order to heal ourselves and understand our world. Um, and so I was hoping that you could give us some examples of that kind of research that you do about how we use stories to help ourselves and heal ourselves. Sure. Um, yeah, there's, so there, this is a fairly new um, area of research within this area of discipline because um, actually historically, psychology has been fairly negative about media, um, it, which is understandable. Anything new is suspicious. And throughout history, media, it moves so fast. It's hard not yeah. to be like, oh my gosh, what's what's this going to do to us? Um, but my research has focused on the positive benefits. So for example, we did a study that was talking about, well, Fans in general, fans of, of any TV show, any movie, any book, how does that make you feel? How do you connect to it? And what does it do to you? And we, we found that there's actually connect, connection between the greater level of fandom people feel and the greater well-being they feel. 
So that's not a, a causal thing, but there is a connection there that's quite compelling. Um, there's also been research that's shown things like um, people, uh, when they, they tap into fictional worlds, when they watch a television show, for example, um, that's sort of a, a, a great drama, like a Mad Men or something like that, Lost, um, that they are able to better understand people, this thing called theory of mind, where we understand that other people have internal thoughts and feelings just like us. Mm -hmm. And it sort of cultivates empathy. So mm -hmm. this research found that the more that you watch fictional programming, because it lets us into these personal worlds, it actually helps us understand people better in the real world. Um, and it makes us more empath empathic. So it's, I, I find stuff like that very compelling personally. And I think it shows that there are these benefits. Um, there are other studies that show that they, that when we watch fictional programming, um, TV, movies, or even read it, um, read novels, that sort of thing, that it triggers autobiographical memories. Hmm. And when we are thinking about autobiographical memories, we're also sort of thinking about where do we want to go in life? What is What does that mean to us? And so those things can make fiction extremely meaningful and also actually make us consider how do we improve ourselves and how do we grow? And um, it gives us sort of a way to look at role models that we wouldn't otherwise have it distills emotions in ways that we wouldn't otherwise be able to um you know real life is big and scary but but fiction distills things so those sorts of things actually can be very helpful yeah absolutely you know i think what you're talking about um is very encouraging and, and quite fascinating. I think oftentimes we have an intuitive sense for ourselves and for others that we're using stories in that way, but it's, it's kind of great to have it mapped out yeah, <laughs> to create a, a, you know, a research base and, and a vocabulary for talking about it because that of course will help us utilize that research and perhaps point us in the direction of how we can utilize literature for therapeutic reasons, whether it's in a therapy office or whether it's personally um, for ourselves. So thank you for that. That's really fascinating. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about is what kind of story arcs tend to create an active fan base? Um, because some of them are very active, uh, more so than others, like the Marvel Universe or in Star Trek, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, um, and, and I'm curious. So how is a story that generates a fan base different from other stories tv shows or films that are really popular um, but they don't necessarily generate what i think of as a kind of very loyal um very often opinionated <laughs> following <laughs> that we would we think of as a fan base i think that you know that's a really tough question and that's one of the questions that researchers have had a really hard time answering mm. um for obvious reasons we can't sit in the room with people while they're watching things and go, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that would disrupt the suspension of disbelief. Be, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so, I mean, the, the thing though that I think is true is, and, and one of the things that I think a lot of people talk about is that a fan identity is something that people have to choose for themselves. Mm. Um, so basically, if you call yourself a fan, you're a fan. And okay. that can be a very wide based phenomenon then. In terms of things like like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or even Stranger Things, which we'll talk about later, I think there's a platform for those discussions. And there's a um she the, the, there's just a sheer mass of people. Yeah. I think that that it's almost like the loudest people in the room in a way <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the most devoted <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. i mean but it's interesting because there's different facets of fandom so there's there's different kinds of fans they're the fans that engage with 
the the and these are the people that are probably the loudest the the material they're very opinionated they have thoughts about the story they know all the trivia and they're sort of within that basis and those tend to be the people that we pay the most attention to it that yeah. um the film companies pay the most attention to as well in a lot of cases whereas on the other hand there are fans who sort of transform the works they write fan fiction they do yeah. fan art they do all those things those things are definitely more popular now because they they have archives online and there are ways to share them that weren't as obvious before the internet but they're still a little bit more niche and i think it's shocking to me when i look at like a fan fiction archive the pure swath of like just the weird it like you would never think of like NCIS fan fiction or something like that but <laughs> people write it <laughs> <laughs> well so, yeah, okay I did not know that but <laughs> that's really interesting yeah. now, Z now, now Ziva maybe <laughs> very compelling character sorry she left the show but it never would occur to me that there would be NCIS fan fiction exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> people connect to all sorts of things and want yeah. to express themselves around it. So, um, but, you know, in some cases it's a lot quieter. So. <laughs> yeah. I see what you're saying that it, it's a little um, slippery to grasp because as you point out, people self-identify as a fan and then they build their world. And actually the existence of so many different types of media now have, I guess I put it this way. It sounds like they've helped fandom evolve into a larger kind of mass force um, with some outliers at the extreme. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, let's talk about Stranger Things because yeah. I, I was fascinated by an, an article. That's how I found you. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. an article that you wrote about season four of Stranger Things, which took them two years to get to. And I'm, the fan base was impatient. <laughs> you write on articles on different topics for an online journal called Very Well Mind. And, I, and now I'm a fan of the series, but it's not like any of the other shows that I usually um, get very engaged with I, i'm a total wimp and i and i can't watch horror <laughs> um and just do they just do scary for me but i love this show and, and i and my fandom has puzzled me for that reason it just engaged and fascinated me from the beginning and i think it has of course a lot to do with the characters um the band of children and the somewhat misfit grown-ups that believe in them and support them i was hoping that you could talk about what you think accounts for the show's popularity and its enormous fan base. And I'm curious to find out if, if you know this, if it appeals across demographic groups. As far as I know, it does appeal across mm -hmm. demographic groups. Netflix doesn't release that information. So uh -huh. we don't know for sure, but from what I, I can tell just by the people that are interested in it, it really seems like it speaks to so many people. And I think that fundamentally, the what the the Duffer brothers who created the show are doing, which is so powerful, is that they are tapping into sort of a brand of nostalgia for people my age, Gen X and and older. Um, there is that very Spielbergian, like young kids confronting something strange that that I think we all sort of gravitate to, mm. no matter what age we are, and for us, we remember it from E.T. And, e. and Ghostbusters, that that that's a reference yeah. in this, this show. I mean, like, the, the, there's something really visceral, I think, that, that we recognize and that means something to us. And I think it also helps that they have these people from different age brackets that that they are young, but then there's the teenagers, there's the adults, there's someone that you can recognize and identify with and really grow to love in almost any group of those those kids and um, in any of the characters. So there's someone that you can really latch on to. I think the storytelling is incredibly compelling, the way that they they encompass this world that's not 
like ours but is like ours yeah um so i think it just it it taps into so many things that people really gravitate to and it does it so beautifully with metaphor and and all sorts of storytelling devices that i think we just collectively recognize and and can really enjoy yeah, what you say makes perfect sense. I, I, I hadn't thought of the word nostalgia, but of course it is set in, in, in prior times that we remember. Um, but the other thing it does is that um, it shows kind of the, um, we can be nostalgic and falsely romanticize uh, certain eras of the past, like the 50s, you know, but there was an underbelly <laughs> in all of those uh, sometimes romanticized nostalgic memories. And Stranger Things certainly shows the, political and monstrous underbelly in metaphoric ways, uh, you know, as as well as, you know, fantasy ways. And so that's a kind of interesting um, phenomenon as well. Um, and of course, the one of the things that I find really appealing is the way um, the you mentioned Spielberg and you have the sense that there's all this compelling drama going on in the children's world and most of the adults are not aware of it <laughs> in the slightest <laughs> <That's true. laughs> except for certain adults that then engage with it but um the children have their own they're not the popular kids you know they're the geeky kids but they band around uh, 11 um uh, who is has these special powers and and is both simultaneously vulnerable and yet incredibly powerful. And she has this band of geeky kids who protect and shelter and take care of her, which I just find to be an incredibly kind of fascinating and sometimes poignant even um, aspect of the show. Does that make sense to you? Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's definitely something. I mean, I think that all of us at one time or another feel like outcasts. Yeah. We always are striving to fit in and we don't always feel like we're succeeding even if from the outside it might look like we are so it's a perfect summation of that it's sort of one of those things where um 11 is is such a compelling character because of that because she's figuring life out at the same time that yeah. she's got these powers and really what brings it out of her is that banding together of friends and i think yeah you know, the idea that we can be outcasts, but we can be accepted for who we are is just something that, I mean, how it's incredibly compelling for all of us, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, well, you know, you, you're, let's talk about season four, because <laughs> that was what your article focused on. Absolutely. And, um, you know, there's different, there's a different monster in every season, and there's a different Season four has a monster called Vecna, who's different from um, uh, Demogorgon and Mind Flayer of earlier seasons. I was hoping you could talk about how Vecna differs. It's one of the things you write about in your article, how Vecna differs from previous monsters in earlier seasons and how he operates, what made him into a monstrous figure, how he chooses his victims and what makes certain of the children vulnerable to his power more than others. Yeah. Um this is what I thought was so compelling about season four was that there was this new monster. And so in previous seasons, we had the monsters like the Demogorgons, the Mind Flayer, and they were monsters. They were pure monsters. Vecna is the first monster we've seen in the show that was a humanoid hmm. that really looked like a person to some degree, a monstrous human, but a human. Um, so that makes him immediately more interesting, I think, in certain ways. Psychologically, we're wondering what the deal is with this guy. And the thing that he does that the other monsters on the show do not is he differentiates victims. He chooses his yeah. victim, um, which is a very different thing. The the Mind Flayer, the Demogorg, they really didn't care. They if you were in their way, you were done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas Vecna actually has a whole, I mean, it's, it's, it's a ritual essentially where he gets into his victims' minds. He causes them, they, they start hallucinating. They have nosebleeds. They have this sense of impending doom. And then 
he attacks and and it, that's the the conclusion of that and then he just starts the process over again and the people that he is targeting are all these teenagers who have in one way or another experienced trauma yeah um and of course the the character that we know that is targeted by him is Sadie Singh's character Math mm -hmm. and um she obviously has experienced over the course of the show enormous trauma um her trauma in the fourth season revolves around the loss of her stepbrother who died at the end of the previous season yeah. um and honestly I, I i always think it's it's a little funny because with the whole band of our main characters the amount of trauma they have probably experienced <laughs> yes last... a mile high and wide yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so it's sort of one of those you know Vecna could have probably picked any of them <laughs> but but he, he he goes for Max um and you know he goes for these other people that we don't know we aren't familiar with but they all have their own traumas even though yeah. on the surface they seem fine we we sort of slowly learn that they're hiding certain things about themselves that make them vulnerable to this figure who is looking to target them. And it, it's sort of a fascinating look at trauma and the way Vecna can be a symbol of that, um, an externalizing symbol of that, especially when we, we sort of understand, especially from Max's perspective, the amount of horror she is dealt with in her life and the loss of her stepbrother and how guilty she feels. So yeah, yeah it's it's a fascinating um it's it's a fascinating thing they tapped into this season, I think, with that monster. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And and with Max, it's interesting uh because she's vulnerable to the 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 powers of Vecna. But we were talking about the appeal of the friendship, the group of friends in the show. And it's the group of friends that is able to somehow help Max pull back and, and find the, the strength and the become, um, you know, stay in the, um, this is a spoiler, but. <laughs> this, is, this is all spoilers at this point, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and, and it's also the power of music. Um, you know, a favorite song. And so that is also um, an interesting aspect of the show that they show that as wounded and as vulnerable as Max is, that the power of her very caring for, and noble friends um, who are willing to go through more trauma in order to try and save her, and also the power of music of a favorite song, mm -hmm. um, which is it's like uh, the antidote to remember the sirens in Ulysses. <laughs> it's like an it's like an anti siren. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, it is. Is. <laughs> so I, I, I was part of what I loved about your article was I just I just got engaged in the show, but I hadn't really um, thought about or analyzed the, the psychological aspects of it, which I just found so fascinating. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about that aspect of the show, Cynthia, because, of course, today, child and adolescent mental health issues are just of huge concern to everybody. There, there's so many sources of worry and trauma. Uh, for young people, ranging from, you know, school shootings, the disruption of the pandemic in schools, um, concerns about a, a burning planet that adults don't seem to have the political will to, to take care of and, and address. And of course, every young person has their own familial challenges. Um, there can be problems with eating disorders or bullying. It, it's a long, long list. Um, and they're all happening simultaneously these days. So I wonder what your further thoughts are might be about how season four expresses challenges of youthful anxiety depression and ptsd and both how these symptoms are revealed and and how the show provides um a pathway back um for some of the characters and by suggestion perhaps for the rest of us yeah i think that's one of the things that the show does so beautifully through max's character the idea that there is a path back and a lot of it is through reaching out to people mm -hmm. and getting that help um whether it's a friend or you know the for in the real world a therapist um but i think that what is 
heartening, I guess, is that things that are traumatic are not a monolith. Mm-hmm. And and that's sort of what happens in the show. Vecna seems in, impossible to defeat. But what we see happening is through art, music, and through the power of her friendships, there are these places where she finds hope. Yeah. Um, and I think that they find it, the, the whole group finds it within itself. Um, they all rely on each other in a way that is what make what enables them to continue to be empowered to continue to confront these horrible things that are yes <laughs> them on a regular basis yes <laughs> um and thankfully that's fictional but it, i mean in in real life i think people have their challenges as well and i think yeah. one of the things that's great about art and that we can learn from um stranger things is Vecna sort of in, externalizes that trauma that that he's a, a character we can put those negative things on the anxiety the depression the PTSD whatever it is um and I think that really helps because I think that a lot of the time we think of ourselves even today with mental illness when it's more accepted there is still this perception that there's a weakness to feeling yeah like we aren't perfect that we aren't happy there's this whole culture in our our society about you know choose happiness and 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 sometimes that's not possible sometimes that's really really hard and i think that externalizing that and and being able to have a dialogue with it is a really valuable thing and then to also know that you're not alone you can ask for help um, which is sometimes really, really hard to do. Yes, is a, a great thing that we can learn from something like Stranger Things, because Max isolates herself early in the show. That's really part of what makes her so vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, and when her friends start helping, that's when she starts to come back from that. And I think that that's something we can really learn from. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a group of friends all around you. It could be one person. It could be a therapist. It could be a trusted family member. But one way or another, people need people. And especially when you're feeling vulnerable, knowing that you have someone there who is able to lend an ear, who's able to sympathize, um, not necessarily even give advice, but just to be there for you can be an incredibly powerful and empowering thing. And it's not like all at once you're gonna get over it, but but it does help. And it's it's an incremental thing to get over any mental illness. Yeah. Um, but I think that we can learn a lot from both the show and, and the implications of what we can do to help ourselves. Art too is a great way to learn about who we are, it offsets a lot of what we are thinking about. Um, there's even studies about how, um, you know, when we have our own personal trauma, it, we may not want to deal with it because it's it's layered with this anxiety of how am I ever going to get over this? But when we watch something on TV or something that that summarizes similar emotions. Um, it can be really helpful because we don't have that anxiety. We know we can turn off the TV. We know it's not going to continue to affect us. So it's a way for us to actually confront those emotions without having it be as personal. And that can be therapeutic in a lot of ways as well. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of things about the show and just what we can do and learn from that in our personal lives that can be really valuable. Yeah, you, you've been underlying what I think is such an important point that opening up to somebody, just sharing what's happening inside, it takes courage to do that. Um, and yet, um, when you make that choice and take that risk, there's enormous healing possible. Um, 
you know, and, and I imagine part of uh, fandom is also people who can find somebody else. I mean, you share your fandom in common. Um, and so you have something to start with as a way of bonding with people. Um, and some of the issues that are in the show that you're a fan of, as for example, with Stranger Things, it gives you a vehicle to connect with other people in the fan world that are actual real live people, not actors and actresses. And so there's tremendous power there. Um, and you know, you're, you're, you, you, you reference it some, the kind of the stigma that mental health issues have had in the past. And you certainly talk um, in an important way about that in your article about how it can really get in the way um, uh, of being able to take care of yourself. Um, whereas if you want really to, um, as you've been talking about very eloquently, one avenue into um, addressing your inner monsters, whether it's depression or, or PTSD, is to um, recognize it takes huge strength. Um, it's not a weakness. Being honest about what's going on is actually the bravest thing to do. And Stranger Things certainly shows that in abundance with Max's character. Um, when she opens to her friends um, and it's the beginning of her pathway back to being safe from the terrible Vecna. <laughs> so does that make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I think that you really make a good point because one of the things that's so powerful about the fandom really is, is that connection that people make. People make incredible connections through fandom. And I think that you know, a lot of the time the fandom continues even after the fans are not that into the show anymore. Yeah. Which is incredible to see, like, they, they find that support system. It really means something. And even, I think, you know, we have things where, you know, you see someone who's wearing a Black Panther t-shirt or something, yeah. and you're a fan of that too, and you, you sort of already have a commonality. I think yeah. that that in and of itself is is powerful knowing that you and another person have a connection even if you really never see them again right um, yeah <laughs> people are are just they're looking for that platform and i think that mental health and especially in the 80s when that show is set but also now even it's 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 something that i think people are working on having an acceptance and an understanding but it's really really hard and people don't necessarily like to admit vulnerability and yeah. and fundamentally mental illness depression all of that it makes you very vulnerable yeah and so yeah i think you're exactly right what you're saying it can be so helpful to have those outlets yeah and and one of the things that you focus on in the article is um that there is in its own way in season four a message of hope um mm -hmm. that's so important um and, you know that monsters both personal and in our families or communities can be tamed by externalizing them into a story and then finding a way to talk about them to 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 um utilize them as a way of as you were referencing in the beginning expand your empathy uh or just recognize um that there are pathways out of isolation so um, anyway, uh, uh, you know, Cynthia, media psychology is really fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> well, it's, it's meaningful, I think, and it's something we can all relate to because we're all, one way or another, we, we interact with media. <laughs> well, we do. And, you know, I just was remembering an exchange I used to have. You talk about you see somebody with a Black Panther t-shirt or something, and I used to be... Um, a fan of Xena Warrior Princess, um, which certainly generated a lot of fan fiction and you yes. know online chats and whatever. But there used to be, um, uh, I used to live in, in Arlington and there was a woman who worked at the post office who would wear a Xena Warrior Princess t-shirt. I don't know how she got away with it. She wore it over her uniform. <laughs> and, and every time I'd see her, you know, she would go, battle on and i'd go battle on you know when it's such a pleasant exchange <laughs> i would be avoid by it so uh, <laughs> when you were talking about those kind of um exchanges that you can have with somebody who's a, a stranger to you but there's a t-shirt that you recognize and you know they're a fan and so you feel like you have something in common with them there's a real power to to fandom um mm -hmm. 
So, well, I, I, you know, okay, well, any guesses about, I don't know how long we're going to have to wait for season five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they took two years to get to season four. You know, have any guesses or hopes um, about where season five might take us? Oh, gosh, I am terrible at predicting that stuff. <laughs> um, I hope that um, we're going to see a lot more of uh, uh, how the kids confront Vecna after... I mean, a fairly devastating end. <laughs> yeah, it's ominous at the end. <laughs> yeah, to season four was was pretty rough. So I'm hoping that uh, they'll rally and and find a way to to. I mean, we we've got to we just had everyone come together. So hopefully that means that there are positive times ahead. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of conflict to get there, but hopefully we'll see with season five. There's there's some good stuff that happens that really uh, makes it so that everyone will be in a good place by the end. <laughs> well, let's hope so. <laughs> you know, at least Eleven got her power back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and may she keep them forever. <laughs> so I guess we'll just have to wait and find out, Cynthia. Well, we Cynthia, will. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun to talk to you. I would like to ask you, how can people learn more about your work? Um, and about media psychology as a possible pathway in their study of psychology? Um, well, you can go to my website, CynthiaVinney.com, um, which is uh, where there's a lot of my, my work that you can see. Um, you can also, uh, there's a journal called The Psychology of Popular Media. That's a great oh. place to see just the breadth of topics that this particular Part of psychology covers. Um, it's a it's a journal from the American Psychological Association. Okay. It's a great, great option. Um, and also, Fielding Graduate University has a, a media psychology program. Um, so if you look that up, that also will give you an idea of a lot of the topics that people are studying. Um, there's a lot to it. It's a really, really meaty area. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely, you know, if, if, if I were of an age where I, <laughs> I were thinking about going to graduate school, um, you know, I certainly would consider it. It just sounds like it's really fascinating and a lot of fun and it's so relevant to the world that we live in today. It so, is. You know, Cynthia, I can't thank you enough. It's just uh, really been fun to talk to you. Um, and I appreciate your telling us what media psychologists do. I feel like I have a much better understanding of it now. <laughs> And also, I just, it's just, you know, it's fun to be fans together. I <laughs> know, I know, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, you take care now. I really appreciate your taking time to visit us on the show. Of course. Thanks so much. Well, that's it for today, everybody. Please join us again next Thursday at 9 for the morning show. Farewell. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>